this is William R. Stimson, and this is uh, February 23, 2022. And I have here Susan Coleman, um, who was a little girl in Santa Fe. And we did two parts already on her reaction in Cuba. What's special about Susan is she, she was in Cuba after almost all the Americans got out and an awful lot of the Cubans too. And she was there for a long time. She actually couldn't get out. And so what she wants to talk about in this video of the later years, what, what happened later on after everyone was out, but she was still there to see it. And the, the, the episode of how she got out of Cuba. Okay, Susan. Hi, how are you? I did do two other videos. Uh, uh, the later years are being something about 1965 on. I tell you strictly for my uh, view, and at the time I was about 15. Uh, so I had spent, as I had mentioned in the prior video, I had spent about three years out of school because the, there was no school. Uh, for my, my level until maybe three years later. And then after three years, I, I started. All of my uh, uh, classmates went on to uh, Havana to boarding schools, the ones who chose. And so I was behind. And uh, the uh, ninth grade started up again. And then I, I joined. I, Susan, I got you back. You the screen a little bit, Susan, so, so you're in the center. No, no, the there. other way. There we, there, we, there we go, there we go. Okay, okay go yeah. ahead. So uh, I spent three years uh, out of school, which is in a very vulnerable age. Uh, uh, very, uh, uh, I did a lot of things. I did a lot of things I shouldn't. I was a teenager. Um, I was um, getting, taking Benzedrine for my tests before, I, you know, at age 13, I didn't know what it was. What is they Benzedrine? Loved Benny's. What, what does it do? It's a hot, it's an upper. Oh, an upper? It's illegal. They have that down in the Alpines, Benzedrine? Yeah, yeah. Leave it. So anyway, all I had to do was go to this clinic and uh, this, this nurse had handed me a couple of pills. Oh yeah, you take them and you're up all night and you get to study. And uh, I just, I said, fine, no, no parental consent needed. I just went and I brought him and I brought him home. And uh, yeah, my mother wasn't comfortable with the idea of uh, giving pills to a minor, you know, obviously. And that's definitely not a good pill. So I took him about twice and I had a, a horrible reaction and I didn't take him again. But anyway, uh, it, at that age, I was already drinking rum and I oh, was what, uh... drinking rum alcohol. I was already already drinking alcohol. Oh, rum! You were drinking rum. <laughs> yes, and uh, I uh, I had uh, it was very isolating, and a teenager needs company, you know. And um, I had a, a the, I don't know if I mentioned before I had this little candy making business that I made fudge and sold it to the construction workers. And the other thing is my mother had an angle with the stamp collections. She would sell first. Uh, editions of uh, sheets of stamps. She would send them to uh, the United States to, uh, I think it was a collector, and she would get cash for them in my father's account. So it was it was kind of a nifty little thing. The, she, you buy the, the stamps with pesos, and then you go to send them to the States, and you get dollars for them. And I was doing it, but she made a deal with me that she could, I could have some of the hard bird money to go to Havana if I would do this for her. So I was going to Havana just to get out of the house. And I was just walking the streets and having, going to the parks. And I had a, a girlfriend who was 26, I would visit her. And then I would, uh, I would come back home and I would be on the boats with the, at that time, yeah, they, the, uh, that was starting, the prisoner thing was starting. I would be on the boats and no sleeping, stay up all night, but anyway. Uh, I was glad when uh, uh, school started because I gave me something else to do. It wasn't so risky. Uh, the ninth grade got canceled. Uh, apparently, they had the wrong uh, uh, 
plan, the, the wrong teaching plan. And they uh, and the everybody who was in the ninth grade had to repeat the ninth grade in Havana. So that was really good for them. Uh, but when I had been there before uh, with, with the school, the teachers were, some of them were pro-cast or some were anti-cast. They were kind of timid. They were actually teachers, but they were very timid. And they were very scared of all of the party people, the communists who keep barging in. Uh, they would barge in at any time in the classroom to ask, you know, uh, suggest volunteer work or to order volunteer work or to talk about a, a cheer, a new cheering thing that they had to have. And they had these planos. A plano, I think, is probably like a class get together, a class reunion, or, or where everyone gets together in the auditorium. And uh, they had uh, this system. It, the, teacher, you, you, the teachers didn't have any control over the, 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 the educational process. These guys would just show up at any time. And they were generally uh, 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 white from Havana, highly educated. They were party operatives, party members of the Cuban Communist Party. And um, uh, they, the, it was kind of interesting. But then when I came back, the, the discipline was much more severe. And uh, they, the teachers were all confirmed communists. And that, another thing that uh, they, dis, they discouraged inappropriate behavior. They had a code of ethics that was called revolutionary behavior. One of them was no cheating on exams, which I didn't mind at all. But a lot of the people in the country didn't take school very, very seriously anyway, because up to then, I mean, why they didn't have to go to school. They didn't require school for the work they did. You know, so that wasn't a big thing. Uh, and um, I had, there was one kid who was um, set to reform school because he was not, not listening in class. And he made some nasty comments to the girls. And um, just, he was, a, he was vagrant. Uh, and so uh, there was something known as a, a, a plano. There was a situation where all the student bodies got, got, um, um, riled up about the fact that they want to fire this one teacher. This, she was a very good teacher. She was on the island because her um, husband was a prisoner, a political prisoner, and she was still in the school. And they had seen her in public with another co companion who was not her husband. Her husband was in jail. So they were going to, they wanted to fire her. And so the whole school came up in arms and they said, well, you know, you're firing her because she's the wife of a political prisoner. That's why you're just using the other thing as an excuse. She's a very good teacher. Why don't you keep her? So she said, well, okay, let's all get together. So they got a little notebook and then they wrote down the name of the student and what the student said as a comment regarding this. And then they kept a record. And uh, this was like a two hour thing and people were, expressing their opinions because we were asked to do this, you know, the way it is. And uh, then at the end, uh, they said, well, you know, things don't change. Uh, revolutionary values cannot be bent and modified according to the whims of the students. And they went ahead and fired her. So it was just kind of like to a way for them to get some knowledge, some political knowledge of the students and their families. And it was, it was kind of a um, you know, uh, it was kind of strange, but the, the school, you know, uh, the, the, the teachers, these, these communists, they were like handlers. I don't, you don't, do you have any little kids? Have you ever had little kids? No, no. And when they take, when they go to kindergarten, the, the, the teachers are, they, they're very careful with them and they push them in certain directions and they use, of uh, uh, basic, infantile terms to get them to understand to go to the bathroom to do this that and that's what they they reminded me of uh uh so uh anyway that that was kind of a, a, a kind of an kind of interesting thing um uh when i uh um uh, when i was there i did something very very foolish um uh, my neighbor told me that she had these little staples and she was throwing them out on the on the street as she was walking around with her baby, she would she had a 
bag with a hole in it and she drops staples down there. The staples that you bend forward so that they are like a perpendicular, they, they puncture tires. And she, it was her revolutionary, uh, 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 her, her counter-revolutionary uh, 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 statement. And uh, I decided I wanted to do something like that. So I went and I scratched anti-Castro slogans all over the school on the outside. Now this is not United States. This is this is Cuba, and um, eventually they looked around at it and they were very shocked. And uh, you know, eventually they called me into the office and they said, "I know you did it." You know, and uh, I just said, "No, I I didn't do that." No, you know, but uh, and so then they uh, they uh, said that we only ask you. That um, that when you're in our country, you obey the rules and the norms, and you act accordingly. And I mean, I was they were right, you know. I was in their country. I shouldn't be acting like a like an ass. And so I never did it again. And I was very very shocked at the educational level and the maturity of these people, because I mean, they could have treated me like a prisoner. I mean, I was only, I was 15 years old, but they didn't have to pay that, pay attention to that because they, they don't go by minors in this, in this, in the society, 14 year olds, 15 year olds, you get tried and executed as well. So uh, anyway, they, they let me off and I, uh, that was a very stupid thing, but anyway, I, 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 I made it, I, I got lucky. Um, um, this this there's good and bad things with this regime you know they were they were paying for the lunches of the people of the students who were up from out of Verona. they you know it was a big thing to have hot lunches in cuba and if you were out of Verona and you had to take a bus you couldn't go home to eat lunch you know this is this was a and so they they would pay for us at a local hotel and I, you know, it just kind of shows me there were some good parts to these people. It's generally the higher ups, you know, that uh, they were more educated. And um, so uh, that's, that was a good lesson. And I was lucky that somebody there was not uh, vindictive or uh, immature and treated a 15 year old with a 15 year old maturity themselves. So anyway, um, then the environmental uh, structural changes we talked about. We talked about that before, um, but uh, I was going to go into more detail. The uh, buildings were slowly falling apart, collapsing. And that's one thing you don't notice in this country. Buildings just don't fall apart. It's hard to believe that they need maintenance. Did you know buildings? I didn't know buildings needed maintenance. but all the center of the city, the buildings were falling down because there was no uh, cement, there was no lumber, nothing. And it was a very, uh, very emotionally traumatic thing to me. And the main street, if you remember the main, main, remember the main street that went on Saturday, uh, it was uh, totally changed. Uh, the grocery stores were, I don't think there was any grocery stores anymore because everyone had to get their groceries at the locally, I mean, at, right near their home. And uh, the uh, there was no Chinese uh, stores, there was no hardware stores. And the Haradas uh, basically had very limited produce that you remember used to go in to get all this produce. Oh, yeah. so they were requiring them to sell their produce to the state for its set price. So it just wasn't a really good experience. and. Uh, are you familiar uh, some of the other stuff I had talked about before, but they also they didn't have a fertilizer and uh, you know so it made a very boring downtown compared to what it was before a bustling country. Just downtown. downtown Hirona or downtown Santa Fe? Downtown Hirona. Santa Fe never was much. But downtown oh, so downtown Hirona was falling to pieces in the center? Yeah. Oh boy, that Main Street was bustling when when I was. Yeah, there. it was bustling. It was happy and bustling. But yeah. There was a there was occasional there was some some traffic 
but nothing. I was all military traffic and a governmental traffic, you know. Um, uh, but they had a they did have take the tanks down the street. They would take the tanks from the New Virginia Cafe yeah. down to the docks. Well, actually from the docks to the New Virginia Cafe. And they had um, be when they would bring the tanks, everybody in the buildings uh, on each side of the street were evacuated so they couldn't see things and report them. So they were all evacuated. And these tanks made these tracks in the asphalt, but just horrible. They basically punched out the asphalt. So, you know, one, one Monday, actually one day I came in and I saw these horrible things in the, all the way down the street to the dock. So, I mean, that, that, was, that was very um, um, funny. Um, are you, and the other, you know, this is just part of the environmental thing that I had talked to you about before that I had mentioned in the other videos, I was just kind of adding there. Do you know there was a gold mine, don't you? Yeah, in the old days, I've been to that place. It's way out in the West. Yeah, yeah, it's way out. Uh, it, it was, uh, uh, yes, it was in Los Indios. The property was owned by my father. You're it kidding. was legitimately owned. He went to court in a Cuban court with a Cuban lawyer and legally got it before Castro. Isn't Los Where Indios it? down south? I don't have a map in my mind. Los Indios is down by Pucaro, isn't by, it? No, no, by La Ciguanea, by Ciguanea. Because this, this gold mine I knew, it, I think, was up more by out by toward out of McKinley or out of Hiro. Uh, yes, McKinley. It's McKinley. It's a, past McKinley. Oh, it's the same. Okay, that's the same gold mine. I think there's only. So, one. Uh, yeah, that was a. There was. It was. It's. It's. It was a lot of just flat, flat property. Flat. He stopped going there. He was afraid they would kill him. He didn't go. He had had didn't go there for a long time because you know they were trying to kill him. But anyway, it's it was totally uninhabited, uh, undeveloped. Probably the property wasn't that that good, but uh, we there were, were herds of deer and wild boar there running around, and then deer, the old deer. Mine. Are you sure deer? I I've seen the wild boar, but deer were in, in other parts of the uh, parts of the island. I didn't know the uh, island had deer. Yeah, they have. They had deer in uh, uh, La Ceiba in particular. Wow. But I mean, you know, that's I'm sure they don't have them anymore because of people, uh, you know, food. It's deer is food. You know, and that's the first thing you do is you. But that gold them. mine was was. Um, <laughs> It was in a beautiful savanna, a beautiful sandy. It was sort of barren land, just sand. Yeah, it was barren and sandy. It was very pretty little plants and flowers all over the place, and strange plants because they were quartz everywhere, quartz everywhere. But it they abandoned it, I guess, because of money or because it the it was the vine wasn't productive enough. So what they did is they took uh, uh, loaders and lay and took off all the soil from the entire. 600 acres of gold mine and put it in trucks and carted it away and got the gold flecks out of it. But so so basically that whole area there is a big pit. You're kidding. They, they did that to that beautiful Savannah? Yeah. The, the communists did that? Yeah, but you know, I guess ecology takes second place in situation like that. Well, it's not ecology, it's just a human appreciation of nature. I mean, no, 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 yeah, and then uh, we used to swim there and the wild boars would come up to the pools and kind of stare at us and- How did you get, get out there? Anymore. That's way out, that was way far away. Yeah, well, it would take about an hour and a half or two to move, go there from Santa Fe. There was a road that went from yeah. uh, past Jones, you pass Jones Jungle and you keep going from Santa Fe, you know. You go a long way, but anyway, uh, the social climate uh, from the there's uh, uh, I could talk about the social climate. Then I'll get to getting out, and I don't know. I hope is this interesting enough? Or it's very interesting, story? Susan. I've never heard any of this material. Okay. So the social climate also continued to change. The um, uh, the not everybody was thrown out of a job. There were a number of politically neutral people in high. Uh, uh, high positions. They kept their jobs, and they they allowed they allowed their children to go to high technical schools. They, the, the children were were real quiet, not like me, 
and the people were real quiet and they managed to get it and they had good jobs. Uh, the, um, that, so, and then there were people who were anti-Castro and they also managed to get around it by being politically correct. Nobody knew about it, especially if you came from the provinces because there was a huge number of new people coming to the island and they were all from the provinces. So you didn't actually know them and their family. Uh, that uh, made difference, and there was uh, a number of pro Castro people we would who would visit us, who uh, were acted like they were anti Castro, in order to get information because we were always being watched, and they would come in and we'd find out later, and uh, they were usually from the provinces because if you're from the island, everybody knows you, you know, places a gossipy place, they know everything about you. Uh, and so, but the ones that were really in trouble were the people who were uh, the immediate families of the, what they call espiros, the political prisoners. Uh, afterwards, this teacher got thrown out, but uh, the political prisoners' families, they were not allowed to have important high paying jobs and their children were not allowed to um, go to a high, um, higher level schools technical schools, medical schools, that type of thing, uh, until sometimes the, the children could prove themselves to be worthy in having good revolutionary morals by, by being tested, by throwing you know, garbage at people in, the, in front of in the planes, by, uh, by doing volunteer work, that type of thing, by having good rhetoric. Uh, yes, the other people- okay. that, that, that communist idea was, was meant, originally meant the way they wrote it, to bring out the best in people. But well, it's just Brezhnev. This is the Brezhnev system. It's what? Brezhnev. Brezhnev. What, what, what it did, it, the way you're describing, it brought out the worst in people. It did. It did. Yeah. And that it, the certain groups became less educated and less beneficial to society. More doctrinaire. Uh, follow the doctrine. Yeah. Now the other one. Go that ahead. were left out is automatically when you declared that you wanted to leave the country, you were taken out of any critical important jobs and your children were taken out of any high level schools like medical schools. And you had to support yourself with general labor or, or, or uh, handouts from your family in, in the States or just, just you know, low menial labor until your, your 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 number came up and you uh, went to the to, to the states. Now you know there's also I don't know if you know there's a lot of people who didn't um, who uh, didn't have any family in the states. They had nobody who could who could who would sponsor them. And a lot of people they just kind of gave up and they they didn't want to leave. They just accepted it the way it was. This is, this is the way it is. It's the same way people do in this country. You know with bad government, you know, sometimes a bad government and they accept it. Uh, um, but they were, but as I said, I said, if once you declared that you were going out, leaving the country, leaving the United States, you were a nobody, you were done. Uh, and, um, but there was a nice, um, um, you know, sometimes they can, you could be re-educated. Re and then if you impress them, you could, get back into the swing. When I was it. there, this was before, in the years before that, one of the teachers, a Spanish teacher in the American Central School was the daughter, one of the two daughters, pretty young daughters of uh, one of the generals, big generals in Batista's army. Who oh, yeah, 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 uh, Casillas. Yes. What's her name? Castillas? Casillas. Daisy Cas and Consuelo. Ex Consuelo, exactly. And what they, 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 the, the revolutionaries killed her father, dragged her father by, through the streets with a rope around his neck, alive or something like that. Anyway, she was a, a teacher and then um, she became an announcer. She was very eloquent with the Spanish. She loved Spanish and she was an announcer in the first radio station the Isle of Pines had. And she, we went to visit once to see and um, the communists kicked her out because because of who she was, her, her connection. Oh yeah, yeah, because of what her uh, her uh, what her residence is. When they she they went to talk, according to Nagel, 
when they went to the Siguanea when he was on vacation, when Castro was on vacation. They went to ask him if they could start a school. Imagine that after their father was there, they asked them, they wanted to start a school. And he was, you know, they asked him and he said some horrible things to him. He said, no, they couldn't start a school. And he made reference to their past and walked away. Sonia Mart, that's according to, doc, to Dr. Nagel on his book. I, I didn't know anything about that. Because when you're 13, 14, there's a lot of stuff you don't oh, know. Oh, he about. wrote about that in his book? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So, uh, um, the, but the, the, there was a lot of excitement uh, way back by, towards the end of 1965, uh, Camarioca, that was the first boat lift. The second was, was Mariel, remember? The first boat, boat rest lift was, uh, I think it was November of 65. And they went crazy. You know, everybody wanted to leave. And so they started going up to the, the Camarioca, this port to, to leave. And they started getting all their relatives from, from Miami to bring boats over to take them over, you know? And everything was fine. And then Fidel went on about a week later or less. He's, then he said that draft age males could not go. They were restricted from exiting the country completely. And I mean, this is not draft age. This is like 13 to... 42 or something like that. It was a wide range. And that was just a real blow. And then uh, the uh, US uh, decided that they, that they were, that people were not allowed to take boats to Cuba. You know, they would take their own boat and rent a boat from Havana, from Miami and come there to pick up their family and go right back. They were not allowed to leave that, their space. In, with those boats. So that was just a horrible disappointment and you could just feel it in the air. People were very disappointed. And a lot of people were in the process of getting out there and um, going, going to Miami by this route. They were caught in the middle and they, they get, managed to end up, they showed their true feelings and their true, true desires to come to the United States. They were basically, their, their foil, their, their, uh, Camouflage was blown, and uh, that that affected them in their work as well. These are all economic things that happen to people, and uh, so people this kept doing the dangerous illegal exits. You know, the going on those boat people that would drown, and they just kept doing that, and they did, or they would leave their uh, their that one male behind and take the rest. But, you know, parents will do anything for their kids. You know, whatever they need, the kids need, they will do that for them for their education. And that was no exception. You know, uh, they would they would try to they would they would toe the line for their children, for their children to get to medical school. And uh, I don't know if you are you familiar with Peter Pan, the Peter Pan mission? Well, from 1960 to 1962, uh, a lot of the Cuban in my in Cuba sent their children to foster care in this United States. There was 14,000 of them were sent to foster care under the Peter Pan program. And they, they didn't see them, some of them, they didn't see them for 10, 15 years. They, they gave up their children to another country. And they, because they wanted so much for them to be better. That was from six to 18, but most of them were like 14, 15 year old males. The exact, the exact ones that were needed for the military in Cuba. So, and then uh, I guess they finally started reuniting uh, about 1965 from 60. So they were alone in, in a foreign country with either foster parents or family, remote family, or they, they started setting up orphanages for these people in, in the Miami area the, uh, until their parents were able to get to come back on the freedom flights. They came for the birth come in on the freedom flights and they would get get back to, to reunite with their children. But you know, the parents will do anything, you know, they'll do anything when they get a kid with a want them to go to medical school, they get a kid who wants to eat well, that doesn't want to be harmed, they'll do that, you know. You know uh, it, was, it really really strike what I, when you're talking the I didn't know these things, it really strikes me because today in America <clears throat> Like 40% of the population has these grievances. Oh, I don't want to wear a face mask. My, my freedom is being inhibited. Yeah, I mean, that's ridiculous. 
it's all this bullshit. And I when I see how hard these Cubans, what 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 pains they went to to get into a democracy, to get back to a democracy, even a foreign they language their, country. Yeah, they give up their children. They give up their children to send them to freedom. And the, the, Amer the Americans don't appreciate now. And, and in a year or two, there's going to be an election that where the Republicans are cheating and America won't be a democracy anymore. It's really sad. Yeah, let's, it's really, yeah, it is really sad. There's, there's one last topic I want to go over before. Yes. Uh, um, that I go into, you know, getting out, but I don't. I, I it's not. It's kind of, kind of interesting for people who live there. Uh, the Corona continued its tradition of the Saturday market. You know, the Saturday market day was something that started in 1900. You know, we we all always the, went to Corona on Saturday. Yeah, all the all the settlers were isolated. They came in with their little carts and, you know, kind of talked to all the other farmers and. And this was a tradition in the 1900s. This continued, it didn't have as many stores, but people continued to be friends. And they would, my mother would take the bus every, um, every Saturday morning, about 7.30 she'd leave. And then she'd meet with Lucy Roberts. And uh, then she'd meet with, uh, then Lucy Roberts and her would go around and meet, go to all the other uh, people in Herona. Uh, you know, the Pearlies of German American, German Cuban. I know the Pearlies. He, he, he owned a boat, right? He had a boat and it was, it was, uh, it was uh, hijacked. It was, it was hijacked by some Barbudo with his woman with a gun and he had a gun. Yes, they were out at sea for like 42 days or something like that. They almost died. That's and he the lost one. the boat. The Pearlies were very good friends of my mother's. The woman, the wife was a sweet, she used to make these. Uh, yeah, she was such a sweet woman. Yeah, yeah, she offered me free free lunches all the time. I could go there and have a lunch free, a, a good lunch, not, you know. What happened to them, but, do you know? Uh, they are in Miami. His, the, the boy had some issues, behavioral issues, but they're in Miami. Veronica is living with her mother and her brother and her husband. But they, he died about 10 years ago, but he was older than his wife. I visited with them. They're right in Miami, per se, not in Naples. So, but they 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 got taken up the uh, the their their business his business got taken over. They left after I left. Uh, but he, his business got taken over in Cuba, and they they finally put in to leave. She By was then, a wonderful, was, wonderful woman. That was a she had a wonderful home. And yeah, yeah, she was a hard worker too. Their no, parents no. came from Germany bought that farm but then there was a la another lady maria la polaca she was from a concentration camp she was in poland she's a polish jew maria la polaca uh-huh i think i knew her too yeah she she was there and then there was uh mary eggers um uh, uh mary eggers who was married to a jamaican she's irish know. She's Irish. She's married to a Jamaican. We had a wonderful community of all different kinds of people, and they all got yeah. along. But you know, well, next time I'll talk about that. I don't want. You know, this, okay, but this is, a, this is a, this is a back memories to me that I that I've forgotten. You yeah, know? really, it's it's uh, something I'm doing because it's important. But uh, the uh, the Haradas, uh, and, and she'd always go say to, hello to Mr. Harada, who was just a pillar of the community, and. Uh, Mr. Kelm and her had a business going, kind of. Um, she would bring him any property like furniture, sewing machines, and he would pay her for it in pesos. Or, and then sometimes my father was flat broke in the state. Sometimes she would get a little bit from my father too. So she would, they would, that's how she would get money. And she would always, she was always over there and bringing him little things, the valuable things. Um, and I, I wasn't involved because, you know, I was too young to deal with that. So that was, it was kind of, he was a wonderful guy. He, he was just, I don't know if you met him or knew him at all. Who is this? Kelm. Yeah. Kelm. No, I don't, I never knew of those people. He was the know. shipping master for the, the port of Verona. Uh, he was a uh, American from Ohio. Um, and uh, we, sometimes we'd see the Gaines or the SRAM. And the Coopers were way out in the middle of nowhere. We occasionally see them, but if you didn't have a car, you couldn't see all these people that were out in the, out in the middle of nowhere. You just run into them in the 
in the, uh, in the town. And a lot of people like to speak with my mother because she spoke English and they wanted to practice their English because they might, might be going to the States. And so she would go and talk to them and they would come talk to her. She was very, she threw, even though she didn't speak Spanish, she did speak a lot of English while she was there. Of course, that in letters. Um, but um, it, we're getting, this is getting to the end of 65, 1966, things got bad. The, the numbers of people were on the island were just large. There was a large number of males in the military and construction brigades. And at this point, because I went alone to Havana at times and because I was American, I was not very well respected. It was starting to get, it was starting to get hard for me to go anywhere without being groped or having obscenities thrown at me. Whereas it's, it wasn't, they wouldn't do that with the Cuban girls. Um, so I had in uh, also, I started noticing now with, with all this indoctrination, I mean, it's no surprise they had they had six years of anti-American rhetoric from Castro, you know, so they, it's only natural that they're gonna hate Americans. So I, I would get really nasty comments uh, from people or people who pretended to talk to other people that I would hear, and sometimes they would refuse to take care of our order in the grocery store. These were all non-Pineros mostly, and so it was very wearing on me. Uh, I had acquaintances, I had friends, but my mother didn't go through that because she didn't speak Spanish. I got to the point where I just was so, I was feeling Cuban. I felt kind of angry at her for not speaking Spanish, you know, because when you supposed, you know, you're in Cuba. But anyway, um, unknown to me, and I, I, the, it wasn't working and I was just so desperate because the, the educational level had, it was going to stop at ninth grade, I was, I was going to be out with nothing to do. You know, I, I couldn't go to the, the boarding schools. I, I didn't want to get married and have babies. And I was never going to convert to their way of thinking. I mean, I probably could have, but I couldn't have faked it. I mean, I could have tried to fake it, but I, I never would have been able to. So um, this was a, this is a very, very dark time, dark time for me personally. And of course, that's all I can talk about is me. <laughs> no, but you've, uh, you've given a beautiful picture of what's happening there. I didn't know this. I didn't know any of this. You were yeah. the there. Yep. Uh, but unknown to me, I guess about six months before I left, my father was contacted by the Swiss embassy saying that the Castro government wanted to buy a tractor. And we, if we, if they paid for his, the tractor, then they would let us out. And so uh, my sister, my, my father had, I think it was 1200, my sister had another 1200. And my, my uncle uh, also pitched in, I don't know, maybe it was $3,000 in 1965 money that they forwarded to the Swiss embassy. And they, they didn't hear anything for six months and they, they didn't tell us because all the all the mail is is monitored. They're not going to tell us that, that in the mail or even on a phone call, you know. So we did not know about this. Uh, and then six months later, they did um, contact uh, my Nancy again and said that they were, had a flight going out that there was a prisoner that they had to to send to this country and they could fill the plane up with Americans. So. That's when they, when we knew, we didn't know anything about it. And then, uh, um, you know, plus, you know, Swiss embassy is not the same as American embassy. You know, it's just two different things. Uh, if you in a country without your own embassy, you really are at the mercy of the country. They can do whatever they want with you. But anyway, uh, then I guess this was about, um, so they sent the price of the tractor and six months later, the uh, G2 or the, came to our, off to our house and said that uh, they had a possible flight for us getting out of Cuba. It, certain contingencies, they brought in a, 10 pages of uh, documents because they wanted the house, they wanted everything in the house. Our house was very valuable for in, from a standpoint of political standpoint. In fact, our house that I lived in is now for the, it's the 
may that's the governor of the island lives there. It's a nice so but my mother sold sold our house to the man who worked on her land who helped yeah, that's, I told you that story. And uh -huh. she sold it to him for one peso. And then the, the, the communists came and told him, well, you can work the land, but you can't have the house. And they put some rich communist lawyer in the house. So right. it's, it's, it's just it's fake. It's so fake. Well, they wanted our house to, to and they came in with all these lists of things and uh, uh, and they were we were signing and writing things down and they said they had we had a flight in three days. That was pretty shocking. But uh, it turns out that the same lady who threw the staples on the highway, she was kind of a friend of mine, an older, older lady, she was older than me. Anybody's older than me then. Um, she had uh, need to have a place to stay with her baby with cerebral palsy. Uh, he, she had to stay somewhere until her boyfriend came back from Iran and got her a, a apartment there. And he was not available and it was just her. And she was living in the back uh, section. And um, then the guy just basically told me, hey, listen, uh, you can't leave until she's out of here because you're, you're leaving and we want to take your whole house and she, she's there, you cannot leave. Well, that yeah, kind of upset me. Uh, uh, and then the dog, the, um, what happened was the dog was out in the barn with the door closed and one of the younger military, there was like eight or 10 military there, came and opened the door to the barn and she came and she barked at him and he, he shot her, he killed her. Uh, and uh, so she was our protection for for many years. She was a big dog. People were scared of her. She, you know, she was a, a very protective dog. And people, Cubans, I mean, the, unless you have a dog, a, a big dog is scary, you know. And uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons we never got killed was because of her. But anyway. You know, then everything, uh, the, any, everything broke down. We were crying and screaming and angry and hysterical and yelling about shooting our dog. It was, oh my God, it was, it was terrible. So, so all reason broke down, you know, and um, uh, we were kind of supposed to leave in three days and I had to get rid of this woman. <sighs> and then uh, I, we asked them to take the dog because we didn't have time to bury her. We were too distraught to bury her. Her name was Queenie. And then um, they left us and said, get this woman out of the house or you can't leave. Now, my mother didn't go through all the stuff I went through. She had all these nice people that she talked to in English. And I was out there shopping. I was out there taking all the crap and all the, the, the passes and the, the evil comments. So she wasn't as worried about leaving as I was, believe it or not. Plus there were some marital problems she didn't want to she's dreaded going back to some of the problems. So uh, she was okay with just, you know, we can't go. We can't go because this lady's in her house. So forget about it, we're staying. I said, no, no, we're not, we are not. And so I went up to, I went to all the houses in the middle of the night. I, you know, looked for somebody who could take her in there, went to five or six houses and there was one excuse after the other. Her ex-husband didn't want to take her in obviously because she dumped him. Uh, and, um, she couldn't do anything because she has this baby that was a, a cerebral a child of, well, he was only, he was about 60 pounds. She's carrying him around. He was about five or four or whatever. And um, so I was walking around everywhere. And I finally got the neighbor down, down the street. He was, uh, he was living very close to us. And he said he would take her in. And this was like the night before we were supposed to leave. Wow, what a story. And, and then uh, we had about 20 chickens and we gave them all the chickens. And uh, um, then after that, I had to go go someplace to get, get all the paperwork. There's a tremendous amount of paperwork. I had to go to the CTR and the Miliciano had, on charge had to sign off. So I, in the meantime, I was going doing all this and we were going to all the neighbor's houses and dropping off rice and beans because we weren't gonna need it anyway. You know? So we were dropping off the rice and beans and. Uh, taking it to different neighbors uh, so they could have it. And uh, so I had to go in the middle of the night to get help from the cartel. And there was a, uh, a, 
uh, Miliciano there, I knew his name, well, I won't do his name. Um, he had to go with me to the home of the woman for the uh, Gratian book. So we went, it was 10 or 11 at night. We went to, uh, to the CDR home and got all the permissions for me to get out of the country, turn, turn in the ration book and all that. And on the way home, he was saying, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, he had to sign off the next morning. Otherwise, we couldn't leave. He says, well, unless you have you get it on with me, I, I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to help you out in the morning. And I can't uh, I can't um, um, I can't help you. You you know, you have to do this and this. And that didn't I, I the thing that is more worrisome is if there's violence. And I knew him and I knew his wife and he, he didn't threaten violence. And so I said, OK, then I, that, that's fine. You know, I'm not going to do anything. You know, you got a nice wife and you got a baby on the way and it's it's not something I do. And um, so I went home and then the next morning at about uh, probably four in the morning, I walked two miles to the uh, to the uh, quartel where he was sleeping. And I woke him up and fortunately there was other people there. There was three or four other people. And he was too embarrassed to refuse to help me because there was other people around. You know, he didn't want to tell them what went on and the blackmail thing he did to me. So I, he, did, he took care of it. He went out and he got got all the papers signed. Uh, we had a local person from the uh, uh, town give us a lift, a taxi driver, give us a lift and we were packed. And we were going to the airport for the 730 flight. And we knew that the uh, the uh, flight was scheduled to leave at 10 in the morning out of Havana. And we were on the 730 flight. Didn't give us much time. Uh, they checked our bags and everything. And the 730 flight was booked. We went on standby. The 830 flight was booked. The 9 o'clock flight was booked. Or the, all the flights were booked until about the 12 o'clock flight. And all this time, I'm sitting there. And I'm knowing that this is like two hours past the flight time of the the, the flight to the US. Oh, what a story. And yeah. I'm just going crazy. I said, because I, 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 it was, you know, I was just uh, beside myself and I was just looking at the clock and waiting and waiting and praying for three seats every time the flight. There's a lot of flights in the morning. Um, and so finally at 12 o'clock, we got into Havana and wow, they, they held the flight for us. Wow. These people were, well, were really, the people in the plane were pretty irate because they were sitting in the, in the, uh, in the plane for two or three hours waiting for us. They said, oh, you are the guys they're waiting for, huh? We've been here two hours, we can't do anything, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, they got us on and uh, that was it. And so they, when we got to the States, we got to New Orleans about 2.30, and all these charitable organizations were there waiting for us and everything. You know, they had coffee at a first aid station. I guess they thought we would be sick. Somebody would come in sick. And that one prisoner that they had, he kind of just kind of walked off the plane and disappeared. It was probably just one prisoner that they had that flight for. And they kind of crammed in everyone else. And, uh, you know, I came to the States, you know, um, that they... First, you know, I had nothing. I had I had a fifth grade education, and I had a ninth grade education in Spanish, fifth grade in English, but I had a third grade in math, and because the math there was not worth anything, you know, and I, I had a third grade in math, and I got to medical school with third grade in math, so or what? Yeah, I I got through some of the courses in high school, I suppose, but anyway. I got here and it was just hell from day one. Um, you know, I realized that a lot of the meanness that I saw uh, in Cuba was not them, it was people in general. People in general. You know, uh, people are like, I mean, if, if they were to know I was Cuban, they would just, the, I got in my only job, the first job was a car hop for, I don't know, dollar an hour, 75 cents an hour. And um, um, that was my job. And the people I was dealing with is, I made a mistake of saying that I had been in Cuba, then they would all say, oh, you 
stick, yeah, this and that, dumb Cuban, blah, blah, blah. And um, um, I was, so I just kind of said, no, I am never telling anyone um, uh, that I lived in Cuba. But by then I had an accent, a Spanish accent, you know? And by then I acted differently than anyone else, everyone else because I was, I was raised differently. And so it sometimes worked, it sometimes didn't. But there was a lot of ignorance in when on my part and when um, um, I was working as a car hop in the day that Martin Luther King died, was killed. Yeah. And uh, they told, they word went out to everybody in the restaurant that Martin Luther King was killed. I said, oh, that's good, isn't it? I, I don't know, is that good? And I didn't even know. Who you said know. I said that I didn't know who even my, who Martin Luther King was, and I didn't know what the whole commotion was, and uh, they were all kind of happy. And they were happy I, that he was killed. I think some of yes, yeah, some of this is a redneck area. You know, but when, anyway, when I was when I was in Miami in high school, the valedictorian was a friend of mine, uh -huh. and um, he knew I'd been to Cuba, and, and he said he kept saying nasty things about Cubans coming to Miami, all these Cubans coming here, and these are no good people. And, he, and, he, and then he said, um, how come it, it is that in Cuba, all the windows have bars on them, you know? They, they, these people are not honest people, you know? But I said, well, in Cuba, the windows go from the ceiling to the floor, they're big windows. And if you don't have bars on your windows, people will walk into your house, you know? It made sense, it doesn't mean they're dishonest, but he had it in his mind. And there was just a prejudice among some of these redneck type people. He was a valedictorian. He was a whiz in mathematics and things. Yeah. It's just, so uh, well, just so sad. I hope it's better now. What? No. It's, it, I think it's a little better, but I just, I just, I, this was for this particular area where I was at, but then I kind of moved on and moved to other places. But uh, a lot of the, the meanness that I had seen, it was just part of, you know, Nature. that's yeah, that's what people were. And when you read the history of, of Nazi Germany and how people were treated then, and how people how neighbors will turn on each other because it was politically advantageous to them to do that, you know. Uh, so I just kept I just kept going up, up, up. And uh, you know, it was a nice country. It it was a lot of freedom. I could do what I wanted, and there wasn't that police state, but it wasn't perfect either. You know, you were a smart girl. You were always smart. You were quiet, but you was. I just had the feeling I was never in class with you, but that you were a sharp kid. And Nancy too. I felt Nancy was smart. Yeah, was wrong. I don't know. Nancy still is, but she went through a different pathway. Uh, the next one is a um, a photo thing, but I don't know how we could do that. I've got the PowerPoint on it. So but, should I end uh, this? Should I end this presentation now? No, I, I it's going to be long because each one of the pictures has an explanation. I mean, should I should I end our um, this this part three? How long have we been? I don't know about about an hour, a little about about an hour. Well, this is uh it's is going to be long because each one of them has a story, you know. Well, come back come back with that later. I just want to say that I found your story fascinating, and I I really got a sense of. of, of of, of evil, the evil business of, of, of manipulating and controlling society with propaganda instead of truth. And I see yeah. that same thing in America today, you know, this is a, but, go ahead. Yeah, that's true. That's the same, it's the same. It's, it's some of the same things in the way people have to protect their children and keep their jobs and keep their mouths shut and uh, about politics and, or else, you know, like in the company towns, it's, I guess a similar thing, you know, uh, but people are very protective of their children, you know, uh, and that's, I felt badly for these families. I felt badly for the families who had children, didn't know where they were going in terms of their educational level. I felt bad for all these people that were gusanos that were literally uh, dis, you know, dismissed and cut out of any type of- Marginalized. Uh, they were marginalized. Yeah, uh, I felt bad for them and the the prisoners. And but I mean, a lot of what you see is there is uh, was a just um, just you know part of what's 
part of what could be go is going on here, you know? It's going on here now. It wasn't going yeah. on so much back then, but now people, it's really going yeah. strong. I met a lot of nice people, you know, uh, and people who helped me. And I was pretty much alone. I was, it was just my mother and me. And I was kind of floating in terms of my ideologies and what I did and what I could do and what I, knowing the customs and all that. And they were very helpful. They were very nice normally. And I had close friends. I'm just like you. I was, um, I mean, I'm, my, my background is full of, I, I had a good education too, but I don't know how I managed to get in those schools. I, I wasn't so good in math either. I didn't have the, the real background that all, the, all my classmates had. Um, I just yeah, want well. to say about, about you. I, I feel that um, what you've been through is like a, it's like a, a trauma. So you've been through a, a, right, a trauma a, yeah. and a hardship. Uh. But the, the interesting thing is sometimes people, who have had these horrible negative experiences, but in their development, they find a way to turn, to draw something positive out of it. And oh, I- Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is, there is, it is, it's, it's true, they do. And turn it into an advantage. And I feel you have that, because it seems like, to me, like you have managed to, to, to prevail and to, to take care of things because of the way your mother was. And because of the way um, you, you have been the one in, um, in charge in a way, and it's given yeah. you a certain characteristic that other people don't have. You're not That's true. around, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, uh, there's a few, quite a few people. I don't know if you've heard about that book, Passport to Life. This no. is a guy who's a forensic psychiatrist and he was in the Holocaust. He, all his good number of his family died, but he managed to save, I guess, two or three members of his family and he came to this country and went to medical school, became a forensic psychiatrist. But uh, he said most of the work of his entire life was done by the time he was 17. That was what was the hardest part of his life. Being in the prison camp. The prison camp of trying to save his family, trying to, to survive, get it, staying alive was the hardest part of his life. By the time he was 17, he was out of there. But that was, you know, but I mean, you know, you can't think about it. You just can't keep moving. And I mean, it's a lovely place. I do plan on doing some more research and, and making a just a picture book or something about the way it was because it was a beautiful place, but fun stuff. Nothing like this depressing stuff I've been talking about. Just fun well, stuff uh, about the 1900s. And I wonder, you know, I'll, hopefully I'll live long, long enough to do that, you know? Susan, it's not just depressing. It's, it's, um, it's really revealing. Of your it's character, revealing, but it's not exactly happy, happy, you know. Happy, happy doesn't matter too much. Einstein said happiness is for pigs, you know. I happiness think is something that, yeah, yeah, right. So, but I would, I would hope to get another one going, but maybe a book or a video of the, the, mm -hmm. the original Q, the original Isle of Pines, uh, be, you know, the starting in the 1920s, you know. Uh, you know, the Japanese American community and, you know, all the expats that lived there and some of the traditions of the time and all of that, it, it would be nice, but, you know, whatever. We're both old, you know. So Susan, I know that about me. Susan, did you, um, did you ever write, did you ever keep a journal? That's no, because it was so traumatic. And when you, to me, I, I just, Throw everything out. I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. No. In those society is dangerous to write your ideas down too. Some well, it's, yeah, but you know, some of the stuff I had when I came back, I didn't even say. My mother had all sorts of stuff, and she liked to talk about all the good things in Cuba, and there were very, very good things. And but I just said I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to talk about it, and so it was it was important for me to to do this. This is fifty years you know, do, to do this now before it was gone. Thank you, know. you very much. I think you, I've got to end now because I think we've come to the end of our time, but I think you did a wonderful job. This one is this, the third part is better than the first two parts, I think, because what just, just, you really gave us a story. Someone could make a movie out of this. There's yeah. Here. Well, the picture one is going to be a fun one too. The, well, the, maybe that's our, that would be our number four, part four. Number four, number four. So work on that and I'll contact with you again. Now, let me see how the way I can. Um... 
actually, believe it or not, it's already. So any of you do it next week if you wanted to. Oh, I, I could. Let me stop recording and we could contact later, okay? So well, I'll you stop and then I'll try to connect with you. Yeah, hold on. One Tell me what I what I I'm gonna send you the copy with your I'm gonna scan the copy with your signature, my signature. But I mean, if you think that it might be useful for show somebody again doing the video, just show the book. The book. Tell people what? what it is. Show the book. Yeah. Guest book. And that tell them what it is. The guest, it's a guest book of the Anglo-American Community Center. And we have the complete uh uh, list of all of the people at the open house for November of 1958. And she showed me the page and, and, and my, my name is on there. I saw the page. It's like the past. Now I've got to end and I'll, then you come back on. Okay. And we'll talk. Okay. Sure.